Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories. We have stories that should thrill you a little and chill you a little. It's amazing. What you'll hear are adventures sent in by you guys, classic stories from the pulp mags, and episodes from the golden age of radio. We have special segments like Ghost Stories with Sylvia. That's amazing. And Paranormal Expeditions. I think we're going to have a lot of fun. So settle in for the next hour and enjoy the show. One more thing. You just might want to prepare yourself to be taken away from today. This five-minute mystery is being brought to you by the Ghost Story Throwdown 2021. What is that, you might ask? Well, you'll have to stick around today and find out. But I will say this. It concerns our very good friend, Sylvia Schultz. Well, Inspector, how are things progressing on the Stats case? The missing woman been located yet? No, I'm afraid not, O'Malley. Not a sign since she disappeared last Tuesday night. How's the husband taking it? As well as can be expected. He's got several thousand set up for ransom, just in case. I'll get it. Inspector Fitzmaurice speaking. Inspector, this is Howard Stats. Could you come over right away? It's very important. What is it? A big box just arrived at my house. Not over 15 minutes ago. It's it's supposed to be some fishing tackle I had stored up for the winter. Well, what about it? Inspector, it's not the fishing tackle. It's too heavy. I, I haven't had nerve enough to open it, but I think it might be a body. Yeah, let's turn this end up. <laughs> uh. Hmm. From the Caldwell Storage Company, Midville, PA, first class special. I, uh, I didn't want to open it, Inspector, until you arrived. How long ago did you say this arrived? About six My sister Abby received it. Well, I didn't think of this being anything but Howard's fishing equipment until the man who brought it in said something about it being mighty heavy. I... Well, I hope I'm wrong, Inspector, but something told me to expect the worst. I'll soon find out. Really wrapped up tight. Now, break these flaps. Now, sit. Holy... It's clear. Good heavens. I knew it. I knew those devils would try something like this. Oh, I can't bear it. I can't. Mr. Stutz, are you expecting this box from the storage company? Yes, I was. I usually have my fishing equipment stored up for the winter. I wrote them a few days ago. Oh, don't you see, Inspector? Whoever killed Claire must have known about how it's expecting this package. They hoped he'd just put it away in the basement, maybe, and not ever think it. Yes, I'm afraid it wouldn't have looked so good for you, Mr. Stutz. Uh, how long do you think she was dead, Inspector? The coroner will have to set that, but I'm afraid she didn't have a chance. You mean she's been dead since Tuesday, since she disappeared? That's the way it looks to me. But if anyone wanted her money, they wouldn't have to kill her. Why didn't they just ask for a ransom? Maybe this party was the one party that couldn't get a ransom. Why, what do you mean by that, Inspector? I'd have paid anything to get Claire back safely. Anything. But you couldn't pay yourself ransom, Mr. Stutz. Nor could your sister, for that matter. Well, what are you driving at, Inspector? Just this, Mr. Stutz. I'm holding you and your sister for the murder of your wife. Why did the Inspector arrest these two for murder? Do you know the clue? In a moment, we'll hear, but first... A missing person case turned murder, and the husband is charged with it. I've gone over the clues in my mind, but I must be missing something. Elementary, my dear podcast host. Okay, what did I miss? Weight versus shipping guidelines. Still don't get it. How much does a body weigh? Oh, I'd say on average 150 pounds. There you go. Where do I go? Well, how about we return to our story? Okay, I guess so. Now, back to our story. Why, this is outrageous. You can't prove a thing. Oh, can't I? You did a nice job of fixing up that package to make it look like a first-class special parcel. But that package never even went through the mails. 
It was here in this house all the time, waiting for you to spring it. It may interest you two to know that the United States Post Office will not accept first-class packages weighing over 70 pounds. It's pretty obvious that any human body crated up tips the scales way over that. I get it now. A spiritual awakening? More like weight versus shipping. One of my better clues. Yes, it was. This five-minute mystery was brought to you by the Ghost Story Throwdown 2021. Coming your way in just a few minutes. I cannot wait. What's that you say? Welcome to the podcast. You should have gathered from our five-minute mystery that Sylvia is back today with another round of ghost stories. This time, Sylvia and I have a showdown over who can tell if the other has faked them out. We call this the Ghost Story Throwdown of 2021. Also on the show today is a shadow story from Madison, North Carolina that just might be the creepiest yet. You're going to have to decide that for yourself. On episode number 485, Daggerheart Station, we presented a story from the OTR series, Buck Rogers. I asked for your feedback on this one via a poll. The poll is now closed, and I want to thank all of you that took a moment to respond. Of the people that responded, 70% of you made it pretty clear that Buck Rogers was not a fan favorite. 7% of you said that you really don't want to hear from Buck again. That's good enough for me. I will have a link to the results in the show notes. I'm looking for stories about time slips and lost time events. I plan to use these stories in the 500th episode. If you have one of those, please send it to me. You can use the contact tab or the story submission banner located on ronsamazingstories.com. Thank you. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. They have over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, computer, Kindle. Whatever you have, you can listen to Audible on it. What am I listening to? Upon Reflection by Sting and narrated by Sting. I'm sure you've heard of the man and you've probably listened to the band, but what is the real story? Before he was nicknamed Sting by a leader of a local show band in Northeast England, Gordon Sumner knew that he was meant for more than his working class background promised. He just didn't know how to get there. In the book, Upon Reflection, hear the singular talent trace his unlikely rise from his days as a young husband and father working as a local school teacher to risking everything on a fateful move to London and joining the police. Here is a clip from early in the book from the man himself. You know, I was born in a pretty surreal industrial environment, which I did not appreciate at the time. I'm from a little town called War's End, and it's halfway between the city of Newcastle and the North Sea. It's a famous shipbuilding town. In fact, some of the largest vessels ever constructed on planet Earth came from my town. I was born and raised literally within spitting distance of that shipyard, and often, for most of the year, the end of the street was blocked by a giant ship, which would block the light from the the sun from the south. And there was a shipyard at one end and a coal mine at the other. I would think, well, is that my destiny? My grandfather had worked in the shipyards. My father had built turbines for the ships. 
And so I figured, well, maybe that's what it is. But this was the last thing I wanted in life because I lived so close to it. It was a dark, dangerous, frightening place. And I didn't want to work in there. And yet, those men and women who worked in that shipyard were immensely proud of what they built. They could look back after a day's work in the shipyard and see something that they'd built with their hands, something huge, something epic, something just gigantic. And as a child, that had an effect on me, the symbolism of a ship, a giant ship. I don't know if you've ever seen a ship being launched, but it's uh, apocalyptic. It really is. Something the size of a department store is launched into the river with these massive drag chains attached to it to stop it hitting the other side of the river. And I think in the song The Last Ship, I describe it as being the sound at the end of the world. So my life, even though I didn't understand it at the time, was full of symbolism, really powerful symbolism of ships and the sea and the history of all of this. So I did everything in my power to leave. I got a scholarship to go to a grammar school even though my father wanted me to have a technical education because it's something that he understood, I wanted a more classical education, you know. And he said to me, well, what do you want to learn Latin for? You want to be a, a priest? <laughs> I didn't know why I wanted to learn Latin. I didn't know why I wanted this fancy education that had nothing to do with technical issues. But I did. And my mother fought for my case and so I ended up going to a grammar school, and then really that was the key out of my town. But the town was interesting in another way, because if you just dig a few feet under the ground, you'll find history. Often they would find Roman ruins. If, when they were enlarging the shipyard, they found a temple to the god Mithras. I was aware of all this and uh, fascinated by all of this, but nonetheless wanting... <laughs> <laughs> wanting to escape. So education was my escape and music. That was the beginning of the man who would become Sting. Upon reflection finds the iconic artist revealing his fascinating journey in intimate detail. Here, how a provincial boy determined to make his artistic mark found his way and changed our musical landscape forever. And you can have his story today for free. Here is what Audible has set up for us. They are offering a free audiobook in 30 days to give you the opportunity to check out their service. This includes free access to the Audible Plus catalog, which is updated monthly with new titles. To download your free audiobook today, Go to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. And you can get Upon Reflection today. Thank you, Audible. And now it's time for your stories. These are your stories sent by you. For you. We have a listener's story from Joan Foxworth, who tells her tale from Madison, North Carolina. Madison is home to the Remington Rifle Company and apparently home to Gun Toting Shadows. Here is Joan's story that she has titled, That Shadow Shot Me. I've had encounters with paranormal since I was about four years old. They all stopped when I was around 11, and most of the experiences I had were creepy, but they never really ever caused me great fear. Anyway, fast forward to my mid-twenties. I was married at the time and we owned a home right on the river. When we bought the house, it needed a lot of work done to it. My ex was really handy and did most of the work himself. 
We were living with his parents at the time, so I wasn't home while it was being remodeled. My ex would on occasion say that he felt creeped out and uncomfortable at the house, by himself sometimes. So, as soon as the house was finished, I decided to have a priest come over to bless the place, just in case. For a couple of years, we felt nothing paranormal. One afternoon, my ex was working on the yard, and I was in the bedroom reading. I saw a shadow in the hallway looking out of the room. I thought it was my husband, and I said, Hey, I see you, shadow babe. Not funny. The shadow doesn't move. Again, I say, It's not funny. I see you. Stop being a jerk. Nothing. No movement. So I get up from bed to confront my ex, and there's no one there. I go look for him, and his car is gone. He wasn't even home. So I'm freaked out, and I go back to the bedroom and close the door. When he came home, I told him about it, and he turned white. He said that he had had many experiences like that when working alone on the home. The very next week, I'm taking a nap on the couch. When I have this crazy, scary dream where I'm in the middle of the forest, there is a man in a dark trench coat and a brim hat. I couldn't see his face, but he had a gun, and then he shot me in the chest. As I fall to the ground, I'm laying there and he's watching over me. I just tell myself to let go. When I did that, I stopped breathing in real life. I gasp, sit straight up, and then I scream. I collect myself for a second, and I hear the front door handle jiggling. I remember how relieved I was, thinking that it was my husband. But then, the door didn't open. I just heard a low hissing sound, and I saw this shadow, and it was coming towards me, getting larger as it got closer. The hissing got louder as well. I was panicking, but I saw the remote to my overhead fan was within reach, and I turned that sucker on. It almost looked like smoke was leaving the room when the fan began to spin. I can honestly tell you, I don't think I've ever been more terrified in my life. Joan Foxworth, Madison, North Carolina. Shadow Stories they are so very creepy, and no two are ever alike. I don't know what to say about your story, except thank you for sharing it. That truly is terrifying. Well, that's it for this time. If you have a story that you want to share, like Joan did, head to the main website at ronsamazingstories.com and click on the story submission banner. Leave your story give it a title, and tell me where you're from. I'll read it if I can. We all love a good story, but what we truly crave is a ghost story. It's time now for Ghost Stories with Sylvia. Sylvia Schultz is a librarian and author by day, but at night, she becomes a ghost hunter. Following a lifetime spent in the pursuit of the weird and the strange, her non-fiction works include Ghost of the Illinois River, Fractured Spirits, 44 Years in Darkness, Hunting Demons, and The Spirits of Christmas. We now cross over the veil and join Sylvia as she tells us more tales from the unknown. Are you there, Sylvia? Ron, hi. Uh, c- come in. Yeah. You were supposed to be here like half an hour ago. What, what kept you so long? I'm not late. Didn't we say a uh, quarter after the hour? Uh, no, no, we said quarter till. 
think so. I think you're mistaken, Sylvia. I think we said one quarter after the hour. No, no, I'm pretty sure I said quarter till. So uh, what, what kept you so long? All right, well, I wasn't going to tell this story because I didn't want to freak you out. Aha, you know how hard I am to freak out. Lay oh, no, it on me. This is terrifying. Okay. Well, I was driving here to your house, and you know that hollow that, uh, oh, it's, I think, about 15 miles out? Yeah. Where, you know, it's a kind of complete dead zone. You go down in this, you don't got cell phone coverage, you got nothing. It is right. just dead zone. You, you know where I'm talking about? And it's just yeah, creepy yeah, and, oh, yeah. Well, I was driving through there, and all of a sudden, my car was taken. Uh-huh. Gone. It was completely gone. And I'm just standing there in the middle of the road and looking around, just standing there, and there's nothing, and it's dark in there. You know the trees and stuff? It's all dark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thick yeah, with yeah. trees, and I didn't even know you had that. I mean, I felt like I was in the Northwest, seriously. <laughs> and so I, I didn't know what to do, but I've driven it enough to know that, well, I just, I'll just have to walk to get help. Uh huh. Your car just disappeared. Just completely gone. So I started yeah. walking, and all of a sudden, this alien ship comes flying in and lands mm -hmm. right in front of me, just right mm -hmm. there. It goes, mm -hmm. and it's ah. about the size of a football. Mm -hmm. You know, just a little tiny just thing. Just a little bitty thing, huh? Yeah. Okay. First, this little door opens. And a giant okay. creature, he was about seven feet tall, had these oval-shaped eyes, big head, and he's looking at me and smiling. Stepped out of the little football thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just like that. Just like that. He had long, uh -huh. spindly legs, and he was gray in color. Yeah. And he had this kind of like white robe wearing a thing on, and, uh -huh. and, he, and he smiled at me, and he said, I'm here to examine you. <laughs> and I thought, alien abduction, right? Well, that's the first thing you think, sure. And so, and I said, well, I, I don't want to be abducted. And he says, no, 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 you don't understand. I need to take your blood pressure. Ah. And I said, I don't understand. And he said, we're concerned about hypertension with you. Hmm. And so he, and he comes up, he takes my blood pressure. And then he steps back in his little machine. Didn't even tell me what my blood pressure was. Oh, bummer. And then he said, stop eating so many hamburgers, and he was gone. <laughs> I, I'm standing here in the middle of the road. I still don't have my car. The least he could have done is brought me in the spaceship. Yeah, and dropped you off here. Yeah. Save well, you the trouble of walking. So I started walking again, and, and after about, I'm going to say a quarter of a mile, there's my car. Ah. Just sitting there. Just sitting there at the side of the road. Just sitting on the side of the road. I swear this is true. Uh-huh. And there's a note on it. Oh? It said, sorry, almost forgot to return your car. Xenofix people bark. Ah. Mm-hmm. You don't believe me, do you? No. I'm going to call shenanigans on the whole thing. Here's the note. No. Take this. Read it. No. You don't believe me? No, I, I'm going to call shenanigans. No. Nope. Well, I'm a little upset that you don't believe me. Ah, uh, dude, we're friends and all, but yeah, no, aliens, no, no. Not buying it. Mm. Uh, I think you're full of beans, as my grandmother would say. Well, the truth is I stopped at Black Rock Coffee. Ah, and the got truth a comes out. <laughs> but you know what, Sylvia? I know that... When I was telling that story, it got a little too fantastic. I admit that. It was a little outrageous, yeah. Maybe the car being taken in the football-sized spacecraft was a little over the top. Yeah, I would have to agree with you there. So, but, you know, if I had said that I lost time and I don't know what happened, you might have believed that. Mm, yeah, if... The more details you put into a story, sometimes the more people raise their eyebrows. Hmm. But I know for a fact that I could come up with a story that you couldn't tell the difference between it and a true story. Oh, you I, think so? Oh, I know I can. 
<laughs> it's what I do. I'm a, I'm a editor, writer, author. Well, I'm not an author. You're an author. But yeah. uh, I know how to do these things. I know how to create an environment that there's no way you could tell. If I told you three stories and you had to guess, guess which one was fake, you wouldn't be able to do it. I know I can do that. Ron, I have a lot of faith in your abilities. I know you are an amazing storyteller and I know you're a great editor. But keep in mind, I have been reading about ghost lore and ghost stories for decades. I am very well versed in ghost stories in general and ghost stories in particular. So I think it would be really hard for anybody to pull the wool over my eyes. I, I've had a lot of practice listening to a lot of stories, and I think I can tell the, the chaff from the wheat. I can do it, Sylvia. I know I can. And I'm ready to prove it today. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Are we talking about a throwdown here? We're talking ghost story throwdown. Oh, so let me get this straight. So you're going to try to fake me out mm -hmm. with stories. Yep. And how about if I turn the tables and, since I'm the author, try to fake you out with stories? So you're saying if I tell you three stories... And you have to determine each one at a time if it's true or false. By the end of those three stories, you'll have more points than me? I think so. So you mean to tell me that if I tell you three stories and if, now I'm going to use the word if, one of them is fake, you'd be able to pick it out? I think so. All right. I accept your challenge. Do you have, okay. I have three stories ready. Do you have three stories that you have, you could do this with? Absolutely. Well, then let's get started. Okay. We will call this the Ghost, Ghost Story, Story Throwdown 2021. 2021. <laughs> Lay it on. All right. Would you like to start or do you want me to start? Why don't you start? You are the show host. So go ahead and give it your best shot. All right, Sylvia. I have a story here from Chicago, Illinois. Ho, 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 You think you're going to skunk me with a Chicago story, huh? I'm going to skunk you with a Chicago story. Ha! <laughs> now, I happen to know, and I, know, I think the listeners know, that this is your home state. Oh, yeah. All right. You're going to have to tell me now, if I understand the rules right, at the end of this, you're going to tell me if I made this story up or if it's an actual ghost lore type tale that has been told for generations. Yes. And you can do it. Yep. All right. Here I go. From Chicago, Illinois. I have titled this one, The Singing Ghost of Juliet Prison. Ready. In the summer of 1932, thousands of residents from Juliet and the surrounding areas as far as Chicago flocked to the old Juliet Prison Convict Cemetery in search of of a singing ghost said to have been wandering amongst the graves, crooning hymns in a dreamy, ethereal voice. As was typical at the time, many of these early ghost hunters came armed with shotguns, knives, and other weapons. It all started on the hot night of July 14, 1932, when the sound of singing began wafting through the neighborhood late in the evening. The singing continued night after night, usually between 11.30 and midnight. Finally, the ghost was revealed to be, or so they claimed, a very much alive inmate at the prison, William Chrysler, who reportedly enjoyed singing on the way to and from his duties. The disturbing issues that arose around the singing ghost of Juliet Prison caused much upset amongst prison officials and local law enforcement. The theory is, is that the prison trustee was used as an explanation to end the sensation, turn the crowds back, and return peace and quiet to the neighborhood. Was the ghost real, or does the spirit still walk the prison cemetery, and from time to time, the singing will return. That story is absolutely true. I take it you've heard this one before? 
I have. I have actually written about it. It's going to be in Days of the Dead. (laughs) (laughs) The people who lived around Joliet Prison heard one night they were sitting out on their back porch and they heard someone singing Latin hymns. And they're like, okay, this is weird. This is, it's pretty, but it's weird, but it's pretty. So we'll listen to it. And they invited neighbors and people started coming from as far away as Indiana and Wisconsin to Joliet, which is south of Chicago, to listen to these hymns. And prison officials started getting concerned because a lot of people were parking on prison property and traipsing around prison property looking for this singer. So they finally came out, oh, late July, early August, and they said, well, you know what? There's this trustee. He's up for parole, and his name is William Chrysler, and he's he works down in the quarry, and he likes to sing hymns while he's working at his job in the quarry, which completely ignores the fact that, okay, why is he doing his job in an unlit quarry at the bottom <laughs> of this dark, dank hole at midnight and two o'clock in the morning because that's when the singing was heard and why didn't people hear he he was uh, doing some sort of work with machinery and a pump or something and why couldn't people hear the pump machinery going so a lot of people called shenanigans on the prison officials story but the prison officials didn't want people traipsing around anymore so they kind of debunked it but I don't believe the debunking. <laughs> well, I'm going to have to say you tagged that one. And I knew that it was a terrible risk coming up with a story from Chicago. <laughs> and yes, that is a very, very true story in the fact that whether you want to believe William Chrysler is a ghost or if he was actually out there singing at 1130 at night, that's up to you. But it is yeah. a true happening. That really did happen in 1932. Mm-hmm. All right, well, that gives you a point, Sylvia, and uh, quite frankly, I'm not surprised. I shouldn't have picked Chicago, Illinois. (laughs) Tell you what, that was really a pop fly for my first one. Yeah, and maybe (laughs) I meant it that way. All right, so I guess it is my turn to Mm -hmm. try and skunk you with a story. I would say so. Yeah, okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. So, this story comes to us from Upper Michigan. The Calumet Theater is haunted by the spirit of actress Madame Helena Modeska. Her ghost was first encountered around 1958 when she helped actress Adissa Lane with a performance. Adissa forgot her lines and happened to glance up at the balcony. There, she said, she saw the distinct figure of Madame Helena, who began mouthing the lines the younger actress was struggling with. Edissa was able to finish the play, thanks to the help of the kindly ghost. Hmm. I am going to say, I believe that one. I think you uh, pulled that one out of the coffers of your ghost stories. So you're saying that one's true? I'm going to go with that one is not created by you. We probably should make the distinction that we can't prove any of these stories are true. (laughs) Well, true. Okay. You're saying that that is something that actually happened. Yes. Ding, 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 ding. You are correct. So far, we're not fooling nobody. (laughs) And that's what I suggested what would happen, except that I'm going to outperform you. Ah, you think so? Oh, I'm pretty sure. (laughs) I'm pretty sure. Are you ready for my next story? Absolutely. Well, my, I think you're going to start seeing a theme here on my story. This next story comes from Vancouver, Washington, my hometown. Okay. And it is titled, The Bryant Road Soldier. You ready? Go ahead. Between October 29th and 31st of 1968, a man dressed in 1850s soldier's attire was seen walking the forested part of Bryant Street. This road leads down to the historic Fort Vancouver area. Danny Harper and his family were the first to report the sighting to the police and the Columbian newspaper. He saw the man walking down the road, slip, fall, and then roll into the ditch. Danny quickly stopped the car, told his family to wait, and ran to the man's aid. When he arrived at the ditch, he found no sign of the fallen soldier. After searching for some time, he decided 
to find a nearby phone booth and call the police. A search was made, but the man was never found. This reporter would normally dismiss such a story as a Halloween hoax. However, seven other reports of the Bryant Road soldier was reported with the same sequence of events. Jerry Malloy from Woodburn, Oregon, was one of these people. His report differed in that he said the man had a ghostly aura about him. Okay, Sylvia, you're up. Hmm. That has the ring of authenticity to me. Mm -hmm. I've not heard it before, but... Are you up on Vancouver ghost lore? Uh, not as much as I am on Chicago ghost tour. <laughs> <laughs> I have definitely, uh, I've, I've read stories set in Vancouver, though. Um, I'm going to go with that story is true. Is that your final answer, as uh, Regis Philbin used to say? <sighs> yeah. Well, Sylvia, I got some sad news for you. Totally faked that story. I wrote every bit of it. I didn't even look up parts of it. I wrote it from scratch. My, 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 I proved my point. Oh, all right. That story is the only thing. There are some true elements to it. Uh -huh. Like, for instance, Bryant Street is an actual road here in Vancouver, and it actually does lead down to the historic Fort Vancouver area, and there are ditches on the side of that particular uh, okay. road where someone could roll into it if they fell. Okay. However, that's where the truth ends. The names, totally fake. <laughs> Jerry Malloy is a friend of mine when I worked for the Columbian newspaper back in the 80s, and uh, I don't know where I came up with Danny Harper. That is just totally fake. Uh, okay. I just said, oh, I need a name. All right. <laughs> so it's my turn. Unless you'd like to gloat some more. I'm done. I'm done. And I got to say that I had fun writing that story. Well, good. <laughs> All right. So let's go to your next story. All right. Okay. This is another Illinois story. Okay. This comes to us from Hennepin, Illinois, which is along the Illinois River. It's uh, south of Chicago by... Mm, probably about an hour and a half. Um, now, this is actually from the days of the Underground Railroad. Uh, there was a slave that was runaway slave that was hiding in a cave down near the Illinois River. And he had come from way down south, somewhere around Virginia. He was had been walking for days and it was starting to snow and he was really in bad shape. So he decided to hide in this cave. As he was hiding in the cave, he realized that there was a dog in the cave with him. And at first he was, he, he froze and he's like, man, I, I, I dogs are, are really a bad thing for, for fugitive slaves. But this dog didn't try to attack him or anything. It, it was, it was friendly. So the dog started tugging on the man's sleeve and the slave was, oh man, I, I don't want to. This, this cave is nice and dry and warm and it's snowing out there. I don't want to leave. But the dog very quietly insisted and pulled on the guy's sleeve. So the, the slave followed the dog out. And as soon as he did, he realized that there were voices and lights coming from the cave. And he realized they were voices of slave catchers. And he could hear them saying, oh, well, gosh, there's, there's no way anyone could have gotten past us. We came all this way through the cave system. We didn't find any, any runaway slaves. So I guess he's not here. So they went back into the cave system, which actually led to the Putnam County Courthouse. Hmm. So the, the slaves said, oh, wow, this is this is great. This, this dog actually just saved my life and saved me from getting caught. Um, he started to follow the dog through the woods, through the, the gently falling snow in the woods. And he ends up in a field where he sees a fence and he sees a, a quilt on the fence just starting to become covered with snow. But he realizes that's the sign of a safe house on the Underground Railroad. They used quilts to denote, hey, this is a safe place to stop. So he knocks softly on the door and a woman opens it and sees him and, yes, I'll help you. I'll, f I'll feed you. And the slave said, well... If you don't mind, can I have a bowl of something for my dog, too? This dog just really helped me out. And the woman looks at him and looks behind him. And she says, there's, there's no dog with you. Oh. 
And the slave looked back and realized that he doesn't see any dog footprints following him. Oh, wow. All he sees in the snow are the footprints of his own shoes going back across the field. Wow, that's a great story. That had me, that gave me a chill there at the end. Um, <laughs> see, here's the problem with it is okay. that you told that story like you would tell a story here. So it's very difficult for me to know if it's real or if it's fake. You know what I mean? It has, yeah. it has that Sylvia touch to it, but that <laughs> could mean that it's fake, but it could also mean that you're retelling it just as, oh, I, I'm going to tell this story. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So do I believe that one? Boy, and the game is on the, on the fence here. This is, this is the mm -hmm. game right here, I think. Um, no. I'm going to go with that one is a figment of your imagination. Oh, Ron, you are good. You're beating me. <laughs> I was right. That is, you are correct. Yes, that is a made up story. You're kidding. No, no. Um, there are, again, with your story, previous story, there are elements of truth to it. The Putnam County Courthouse in Hennepin was a stop on the Underground Railroad by virtue of the fact that there was a tunnel that led from the courthouse basement to a cave system that ended up at the Illinois River. And slaves were ferried down that tunnel to safety at the river. But other than that, I made that story up. <laughs> well, I got to say, if you had told me that you didn't make it up, I would have believed it. It was <laughs> that you. good a story. But it Thank just proves, it proves my point that as an author, you have that ability to do that. <laughs> and so it was a great story. And I'm well, sure the you. listeners enjoyed it as fake as it was. <laughs> 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 but I hate to point out that it's two to one. So yes. it comes down to this last story. The best you can hope for is a tie. Right, right. Okay. That's, that's, Tell me another story. That's the best you can hope for. Okay. This last <laughs> story, which could be true or could not be, you're going to have to figure that out, mm -hmm. comes from my brother's neck of the woods, Santa Fe, mm -hmm. New Mexico. Now, Santa Fe isn't actually near where he li lives, but it is in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. I have titled this The Cigar Smoking Nun. <laughs> okay. It is said that Sister George haunts the inn and spa at Laredo in Santa Fe. She was a member of the Order of the Sisters of Laredo and taught at the Laredo Academy, a girls' Catholic school located where the hotel is now from 1953 until 1968. The first reports of her presence, according to local tour guide and ghost expert John Lorenz, were in the late 1970s. Owner of the Three Sisters Boutique, a shop located at the hotel, had some interesting experiences. Every morning, there was an extra $10 bill in the cash drawer. One day, according to witnesses, a rack of clothing levitated. And reportedly, the lights would go on and off in the shop, and the odor of cigar smoke would permeate the air. No one knows for sure if the Corporal Sister George actually wielded a stogie. <laughs> there you have it, the cigar smoking nun. Did I make that one up, Sylvia? Hmm. Well, let's see. I'm really going to have egg on my face if I'm wrong. You have specific dates. Mm -hmm. You have a building that was repurposed. Mm -hmm. Then you have very common poltergeist activity with the, the smell of the cigar and the, the levitating clothes rack. And the, the, the extra $10 bill, that's an intriguing touch. Um, <laughs> well, thank you. I came up with that on my own. Or did I? <laughs> Oh, again, I'm not as familiar with Santa Fe ghost lore as I am with Chicago ghost lore. And now I just sound like I'm making excuses. <laughs> um, 
let's go ahead and say this one's true, just because it's so fun. <sighs> Believe it or not, this one is totally true and documented. Uh, it is. I got that one right off the Chamber of Commerce website. Nice. I mean, it was right there, word for word. I didn't even change a single word. Excellent. So you got that one. So, but that gives you a point. So <laughs> right we're back, on. <laughs> we're back to Tide. All right. So it comes down to your last ghost story, Sylvia. Will I guess it right? Because if I guess it right, I win. If I guess it wrong, it's over. That's right. The best I can hope for is a tie. That's yeah. right. Okay. So are you ready for this one? I'm ready. Okay. Now this, we go across the pond for this story. There was a family that in Yorkshire that bought a house. And the, the first thing they did was the owners who bought it actually went on vacation, an eight-day vacation. So the only people in the house were their teenage son and his grandmother. They were alone in the house, and they started noticing very strange things happening. Um, the first thing that they noticed was that there was a layer of chalky dust that fell over everything just in one room. So they had to clean up this dust. But the weird thing was that this dust didn't fall from the ceiling. It fell from about shoulder height. It just materialized out of thin air and fell onto the floor and onto the furniture. They noticed that house keys would fall down the chimney. These keys didn't match any room in the house. They didn't match the front door of the house. They were just unidentifiable keys that would fall down the chimney. The teen and the grandmother found a white mohair coat in a pile of coal in the basement. And when they picked it up, there wasn't a spot of coal dust on it. It was just still pristine white. Kitchen drawers opened and shut on their own. Um, there was jam smeared on the walls and the stairs. Eggs in the kitchen hovered in midair. Now, somebody came to visit the house, and she was a complete skeptic, didn't believe a word of what these folks were telling her. So she's hanging out in the kitchen, talking with the owners, and she did not notice that the poltergeist had opened the fridge and slowly lifted a jug of milk over her head oh, my word. <laughs> until the polter poltergeist dumped the milk on her. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There was a strip of wallpaper that detached itself from the wall, peeled itself away from the wall, and started swaying like a cobra. And green foam started coming out of the hot water taps. The family named the poltergeist Fred, but the press, who wrote stories on it, called him Mr. Nobody. Hmm. So, did I completely make all this stuff up? Well, or is this true? When we created the rules of this game, we said that one story had to be fake, but we didn't say that two stories couldn't be fake. True. And there, I have a real problem with this one. Because okay. if you, do you remember the story I told at the first about my car being taken and the alien football sized craft thing? Yeah, yeah. I feel the same way about a jug of milk. <laughs> Okay. Sylvia, this story is totally fake. I don't believe it at all. Well, uh, <sighs> you're kidding. This describes the poltergeist cased in Pontefract, Yorkshire. The poltergeist was actually known as the Black Monk of Pontefract, a very famous poltergeist case. The ghost finally appeared after weeks and weeks of poltergeist activity. The ghost finally appeared, and it appeared in black robes. And the family did some research and realized that at that house, way back before it was a house, it, it was a monastery. And there was a monk from medieval times that was hanged for assaulting and killing a girl and his body after the hanging was mm. thrown down a well and that well is now under the house at 30 east drive in pontefract yorkshire okay well i'm sticking with my original thing i don't know <laughs> if i believe the milk part <laughs> i think that's over the top but we have a problem we are then. tied 
We are tied. Okay. But I have a solution. So um, we're running out of time here today. So what we'll do, Sylvia, is on the next Ghost Stories with Sylvia, we'll both bring one more story each, and it will be either true or false. But with one caveat, there has to be some sort of proof with it. Ah. Something that nobody has been able to explain that we can either send a link to and say, here's a picture, or... Yeah. Like, well, for example, going back to the Texas lights that we talked about a long time ago. Well, that was fully documented in a article on the National Geographic. Ooh. So to me, and I think you agreed with me, that that gives it a pretty good authenticity there if, if it, National Geographic is there with their crew. I should say so, yeah. So that is the caveat. If the story's true, it has to have some solid proof. Okay. If the story's fake, it doesn't matter. All righty. Sounds good. All right. That will be in the next Ghost Stories with Sylvia. Perfect. All right, Sylvia. Well, I think we used our full time on that this time. That wasn't the plan, <laughs> but I think... I think we did good things today. I think we did. I think that people will enjoy that. Well, you and told now they can stories. look forward. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And now they can look forward to uh, the next ghost stories to Sylvia to see who actually wins this thing. <laughs> the suspense is unbearable. Yeah, I'm sure they're they're at home going, yeah, can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Sylvia, let's talk about the blog. Okay. And I've been looking forward to this all day. <laughs> Are you ready? Yes. All right. In your blog this week, you wrote, The distance a frog can jump is not determined by the power of its back legs, but by the strength of its front legs. Now, how is that possible? Sylvia, that makes no sense. Did you make that up? I did not make that up. I found this little fact, and I thought... It was just entirely fascinating. The reason that a frog's jump strength is not determined by its back legs, but so much by its front legs, is because those front legs have to absorb the impact of the landing. Ah. Yeah. So when you think about it, it does make sense. So it's a look before you leap scenario. There you go. Yeah, that's what I said on her blog. So <laughs> now, Sylvia, you do that every Monday-ish, yeah. and you uh, put out a strange fact on your blog for people just to mull over, and that happened to be this week's. So thanks for doing that, Sylvia. Absolutely. What do we got going on on the Lights Out podcast? Oh, I'm excited man. about this. We have a shorter lights out this time around. It's only about uh, 25 minutes or so, but it is a collection of ghost stories from Gettysburg. These are people's mm. experiences that I was able to collect. They graciously shared some of their very personal experiences with me. The veil at Gettysburg is very, very thin, and sometimes people have encounters with the other side so that's the lights out that is coming up that's episode 98 and oh 99 goodness, and close. 100 are on their way well i had a chance to listen to your uh the, the one that's live as we're recording this devil's den yeah and i'm going to tell you that this one was totally fun and it is my favorite style of Sylvia podcast. You're just out there talking to people that are fellow ghost hunters. Maybe not. Uh, so I think you would walk up to anybody and ask them, do you see a ghost? <laughs> but, uh, but that's what it feels like. You're with Sylvia out there at Devil's Den, and she's just talking to people and their experiences they've had. And it is great fun. And you feel like you're there. You can even hear the wind blowing as she's talking. I loved it. It was a great episode. Highly recommend it. It's called The Devil's Den, Gettysburg. Really good podcast. Oh, thank you. And you will be pleased to know if that is your podcast jam, that episodes 99 and 100 are going to follow that style. Both of those are um, going to be encounters with uh, the, an actual investigation. Episode 99, we are going to be investigating a Confederate field hospital. 
Mm -hmm. And for the 100th episode of Lights Out, I'm very excited. Uh, We are going to be exploring the high water mark. Oh. Yes. Coming on towards dusk, I visit the area where Pickett's Charge ended and failed. Ah, that, believe it or not, is a movie, that that battle. Yeah, yeah. So, good stuff. I can't wait. Thanks. <laughs> All right, Sylvia. Well, I think that by the clock on the wall, it's time for me to jump into my disappearing vehicle. <laughs> and I swear that happened. Uh-huh. And, uh, yeah. And uh, head back to Vancouver, Washington, to where I can tell more fake ghost stories. <laughs> Yeah, you skunked me. Yep. But, hey, we didn't have a winner. And right. I could have won it because I, you know, I was teetering on that milk jug. That it was the milk jug that <laughs> made me think, no way. <laughs> I even believe the car keys or the, the house key thing. Well, for me, with your story, I was kind of teetering with the, the ghost falling and rolling into the ditch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If I had been thinking about it, I would have said, well, why did he roll into the ditch? Why didn't he just disappear <laughs> like a ghost normally should? That's a good point. Yeah. Now that I've, I should have written that differently. Yeah. It was it was the dates and it was the names that really. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, and the fact that uh, it's I've tried to make it sound like it was torn right out of the Colombian newspaper. Yeah. Yeah. You did a good job. Yeah, well, hey, I've had some experience with journalism. (laughs) (laughs) All right, Sylvia. Well, I got to say, of the shows we've done, this one has been a kick in the pants. I've loved it. It was a great time. Yes. Thank you so much for joining me today. And uh, thanks for being here, Sylvia. I loved it. It was a blast. Ghost Stories with Sylvia was brought to you by Gladys Goodies. I always have a great time talking with Sylvia and I learn all kinds of new stuff. If you want to visit her on her home turf, head to sylviaschultz.wordpress.com. There you will find her blog and access to the podcast Lights Out. I will have links available in the show notes. Thank you, Sylvia. Gladys Goodies Treats are a 100% natural, nutrient-rich treat that pets love to eat. You can get your treats and some really cool swag for your dog and cat at gladysgoodies.com. And don't forget to use our very own promo code, RONS. That's R-O-N-S. And you'll get a 20% discount on all of your purchases. That website again is gladysgoodies.com. I hope you enjoyed this edition of Ghost Stories with Sylvia. As amazing as it sounds, that was episode number 488. And we did it with the help of Joan Foxworth and our very own Sylvia Schultz. My thanks to you both. If you want to follow the podcast or the blog, head to ronsamazingstories.com. There you will find any of the links I mentioned and how to contact us. Do you want to help the show? The best thing you can do is to tell your friends all about it and please leave reviews or feedback wherever you listen. Clicking that follow or like button makes us grow. Thank you for listening, and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories.